So they're at that talk, right? And they should be along for the ride. Welcome, everybody. Uh this is Alan Sherman. Uh, welcome to the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Uh, today, it's a pleasure to have um, David Shom and Bart Perneal, um, who will talk about a new voting system, Vote XX, which um, is a coercion resistant system um, that can be used in a variety of settings, including uh, remote. I'd like to remind everybody that. The next application deadline for SFS scholarships at UMBC is November 15th. We encourage you to apply. It's a very generous scholarship that includes tuition, stipend, professional expenses. You need to have junior status or higher at the time the scholarship begins. Um, to apply, check out a scholarship retriever. There's also information on the Cybersecurity Center webpage. Uh, we are recording and we will post a, a copy of this video on that website. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce uh, David Shom, who's a, a well-known researcher in cryptography. Thanks, Alan. Uh, like, it's such it's great to be here. And I was just mentioned before the, the lecture that we, uh, you know, I think my uh, the collaboration between Alan and uh, myself began uh, with a UMBC lecture. Well, I mean, we knew each other from the, uh, Alan was the co-program chairman for Crypto 82, which was the covertly organized crypto conference that launched uh, IACR, even though the government, uh, the NSA, then the head of the NSA was threatening anyone to organize, who organized conferences or sessions on cryptography. Um, so that basically set cryptography free. And uh, Alan was a part of that. He was working with, he was a graduate student at, with Ron Rivest at the time, but they were the co-program chairs. And then later when I gave a talk at UMBC, uh, we started working on voting together and that, uh, you'll see some of the results of that. Um, so uh, I'm joined here by uh, Bart Perneal, who I've also known forever, uh, was the, Bart was, I just want to say, was the, uh, you know, he was a graduate student like, or some kind of thing like that, very, you know, underpaid, junior person at, at, at a university in Belgium uh, for this uh, CAFE project, the Litter for the Right project. He read that they're part of the project. And then uh, now he's the head of the whole uh, department and he's built it up to be like the largest security department in the world, I believe. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to be working with Bart uh, again on, on, and on this topic, which I know we've, we've both been interested in uh, over the years. So, um, uh, but let, let me just say real, real quick uh, why I think this talks really extreme about a, 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 a very important a, a timely uh, results. It, it really represents like a breakthrough, a sort of cutting of the Gordian knot of what is actually the biggest uh, fundamental uh, obstacle to democracy uh, going forward and Moreover, it's not just a theoretical breakthrough. I mean, we are doing our part uh, to to on the innovation side to actually bring this into use, and and we think that the use is going to be very easy for people, and will work out fine. And uh, um, and uh, it's quite surprising how this breakthrough approach can apply to the whole, basically the whole spectrum of voting systems. So. Um, I think Bart's going to handle a portion of the talk, and then I'll uh, come back in, and then Bart will wrap it up. Uh, but uh, you know, understand that without, uh, in my, per I just want to express one last thing. And the, the, you know, if we cannot, if we've seen in the last century how if voting and uh, democracy is weakened, the kind of evil that that people are able to. Uh, uh, perpetrate and this could be the destruction of civilization if this happened again with current levels of technology so i think our main way through the only real chance is is more democracy not less and that means that there's going to be voting outside of polling places 
and also with pandemics. So if we, you know, because of the, the ability to make payments electronically online, this improper influence and coercion, doxing and so on is, you know, front and center is the big obstacle towards democracy actually being able to be improved and, and, and uh, carry civilization through. So uh, I think this is a big, big deal we're talking about and please uh, ha have a, uh, pay close attention to it if you, if you have to. Thanks very much. Over to you, Bart. Thank you, David, and it's a pleasure to be here. So today we'll explain Vote XX, a system that shows how you can achieve coercion resistance in uh, voting. This is a part of a team effort. It's a very large team. You already met David, who is leading the team. I'm, I'm one of the other contributors. So in total, there is five universities involved, and there is some faces that may be familiar to you, um, plus also some people from the XX network, uh, including David. And people together have lots of experience. They wrote many papers on voting protocols, and I think they also have experience in running real voting systems using cryptography technologies. Um, you will hear later about Tacoma Park. Myself, I am guilty for converting the ICR from voting with paper envelopes to actually Helios, which was actually more efficient. It was also driven in part by some postal strikes that disrupted our elections. Um, and also I've been involved in, in designing the Belgian uh, voting scheme, the, the polling scheme, uh, but also uh, the pandemic uh, this spring, I was running together with Philip Zagorski, our rector elections um, using a system that combined a mix of uh, paper and internet voting. So we want to not only write a nice paper, but also actually build systems and systems that really work in practice based on our experience. So the main achievement of VoteXX is that it's solve the improper influence problem. So if you vote of the internet in particular, there is no more control of the voter. The voter is not in a polling place, cannot be observed by officials. And it may be easier to coerce the voter to make the voter vote for somebody else than he or she originally intended. Or it may be possible uh, to bribe the voter so the voter will sell his vote uh, again to vote in favor of some other candidate than the one he or she originally intended. This is known to be a very challenging problem and a few systems have been proposed to deal with this problem, but these systems turned out to be not very practical. David will discuss them later. So the main idea of VoteXX is to actually allow voters to nullify their vote. So there is a registration phase and then a voting phase, then there is a notification phase in which you can actually cancel your vote. And by adding this extra phase, it also becomes more practical to actually avoid coercion. And we'll come back to that in more detail, of course. So it's a key issue to overcome. Um, the nice thing of vote access is it's a generic approach. So it's, of course, designed first in mind for e-voting, so internet voting. But it also can work when you have mail-in ballots, so when there is a paper component, so you get, for example, a ballot on the internet, but you send it in the mail, or vice versa, you get um, some piece of paper in the mail with some codes, perhaps, and then you uh, vote online. And it can also be used in polling place uh, systems. And the system is actually uh, quite simple. Uh, in conceptually, it's quite fast, low cost, and indisputable. Um, we have a built to demo implementation. And there is a universal composability security proof of the system. So this is the summary in one slide of what has been achieved. And now we go into more detail. So as David already mentioned, um, it becomes more and more difficult to tell people that they can't vote online. The younger generation is used to do their banking online. All the social interactions are online. And so politicians and younger people say, why can't we vote online? And of course, the experts say this is a very challenging problem because of several reasons. We can't trust computers, but also because if you vote online, improper influence is a bigger problem. As I mentioned, you can control the voter. The voter is actually can be under control of somebody else or can be selling his vote to a third party. So and online, this is a lot easier. Now, this problem of improper influence uh, or vote buying is not a new problem. If you go back to the history of voting, um, you can look in the Roman times, totally before Christ, uh, Roman society was already in crisis and they had laws against these kind of things and there was actually wild corruption and buying of votes happening already in Roman times. And some historians believe that this actually contributed to uh, the decay of the Roman uh, Empire as it was and this led to the, the effect of the emperors rather than having a, a democratic system. 
Also in the 18th century in the England, there was actually quite some widespread practices of vote buying um, of hundred thousands of pounds at a time being used to buy elections. Um, and also in the US, I think in the mid and the late 19th century, uh, vote buying was a major problem. To go to modern times, um, if you look at the press uh, in Israel in 2002, a minister was actually fired for a vote buying scandal. Um, and this is a problem all throughout the world. So some countries have specific legislation against vote buying. But if you look at uh, Thailand, um, Africa, Latin America, um, people have been doing questionnaires to voters. And so in Thailand, 20% of voters claimed they were offered money or some other goods uh, in um, Africa. It was about 16%, Latin America, 15%. This is a real problem that really affects real elections. I'm also familiar with the US situation, but again, if you look at the press, it seems that in East Kentucky, there is also uh, a serious problem with this. And it's kind of ingrained in the local society. People there seem to believe that this is actually how voting should happen. You should get some payment, um, and then you know how to vote in the proper way. So even in my own university, when I was running the elections for rector, um, I was contacted by somebody in the afternoon who said, um, I have to tell you that I have the wrong vote in the morning, um, and can you please change my vote? So, and then I asked why he changed his mind and became very fuzzy about this. But to me, it was a clear indication that maybe some improper influence was being applied there as well. Now, it's not only about exerting pressure, there is also techniques that um, change the voting or that actually help to do improper influence. A very well known technique, which can also be used in polling booths, it's designed for polling booths, is the chain voting technique. So the mafia first gets um, one empty ballot and then fills it in in the way they want it. They give it to the, the first voter, and the voter, they tell him to um, cast his vote and come up with an empty ballot, which then change again. And so by, by chaining this, they can actually make sure that everybody votes in the right way. Uh, another technique that is being used to pressure people and to verify that they do what they're being told is in elections where you have quite complex patterns. Like in Belgian elections, uh, very often you have 20 candidates and you can vote for any out of 20. So you can vote for one, for two, but also for 15 or for 18. And so in this case, you can pre-specify a pattern and then later detect with an accomplice among the counters that this specific pattern was present in the vote. So improper influence is not only a problem online, it also exists in physical voting, polling booth voting, but of course online the problem is bigger and so it's more important to try to address this. But it's a real problem that really requires a solution. And so this is the problem that vote XX try to solve. So by having this nullification technique, we will be able to cancel a vote. And so this means that even if you influence the voter, you will not actually be able to tell how he or she really voted because afterwards the vote can always be cancelled. Now, if you look at internet voting, there is other problems apart from improper influence. A second major problem is that you can't trust hardware and software. So this software may be full of malware or the machine may be manipulated. And so it may well be that the voter votes for candidate A, but in fact, the machine behind his or her back votes for candidate B. And so this is also a problem that our system solves, but in general, it's a hard problem to solve. A typical technique is to work with multiple devices or to work with extra codes. If you have paper, uh, you can send to the candidate, you can work with extra codes to avoid this problem. And then the third problem is, of course, that you can kind of try to stop the vote. So this means that by using, for example, DDoS attacks, you can bring down the voting server. And that way, of course, you make it impossible to vote. So uh, for this purpose, the vote text design is fully decentralized um, in terms of election authority, and it uses a mixed network that's highly robust. So you can actually ensure that the system will have sufficient availability um, over an extended period of time so that the elections eventually can take place even under denial of service attack. But so just to be clear, our proposal addresses this three point, but the main new ID, the main innovation is in the improper influence. So the main idea is to actually um, have some assistance to the voters so the voters identify Prior to the election, some people they trust, um, and we call them hedgehogs. And what the voters do is they will actually give the key to the hedgehog. And in the second phase of the election, so there is the registration phase, and there is the voting phase, well, the third phase to be more accurate, you do actually a notification phase, and there these hedgehogs can be asked based on a subtle signal by the voter to actually change the vote. 
So this means that um, even if you can convince a voter to vote for a specific candidate, afterwards the voter can signal the hedgehog and the hedgehog can change the vote to nullify the vote. And this is very robust because even if the coercer tells the voter to give up all the keys, um, well, in, even in that case, uh, the system is coercion resistant because the coercion can, of course, then change the vote. The voter can change the vote or nullify the vote, but also the hedgehog can do it. And so the coercer can get the keys of the voter, but that will not be enough to actually prevent um, the voter from actually modifying or nullifying the vote. And that's the key idea is to have some extra party. The previous systems try to have give voters two keys, say valid keys and invalid keys, or have two kinds of votes, valid votes and invalid votes. But that meant that if you know everything the voter knows, you can still uh, coerce them. It also becomes very complex for the voter. So here the voter has only one key, but you get an outside party that helps the voter to nullify the vote. That's the core idea of uh, XX, vote XX. So a few more things about the setup. So we consider here a very simple example, but of course the scheme can be further generalized, uh, where a voter has two keys, two public-private key pairs. We have a yes key pair and a no key pair. And of course, during registration, you have to register your public keys with the election authority. And so depending on whether you want to vote yes or no, you will actually um, use one key or the other key for your vote. And so this registration phase is a prior requirement. And afterwards, the system has a list of all the public keys, two per voter. And because you do this registration of these keys over anonymous communication network, like the exact network, there is no link to the voter identity. So this list of public keys, yes, and no keys per voter is public, but there is no link to the identity of the voter. And the voters can give their private keys, their yes and their no key to the hedgehog, one or more hedgehogs at any time before the pre tally So they share their keys and the hedgehog can use these keys to later on, based on a symbol of the voter, to nullify the vote. And then what are the goals of adversary? So the main goal of this system, in which it's uh, distinguished from other systems, so most other internet systems, vote systems give up on this, they don't have this feature, um, that you actually cannot influence a voter ballot choice to coercion or to vote by. So you can actually protect against this because of the fact that a vote can always be nullified. So even if you pressure the voter or the voter sells you their vote, We'll never be sure that this is the real vote because afterwards the vote can be nullified without uh, you being able to detect this as a coerce. Then, of course, we have the other standard requirements for election systems. Um, and Dr. Sherman did actually a very nice study of literature and he came down with the other requirements. So most voting systems have a complex list of requirements, but I think you can bring them down to those four conditions. So the first one is avoiding improper influence. And of course, it not be possible to tamper with the tally. Then it should not be possible to disrupt or discredit an election. And then, of course, also privacy. It should not be possible for somebody to learn how a voter really voted. And then an interesting question is, can we formalize coercion resistance? And this is, we're not the first one to look at this problem. There is already several papers being written that have tried to formalize coercion resistance. And actually, it seems to be more complex than you would think. So there were several papers who put forward formal models. In this case, you may have to make a distinction between, on the one hand, vote selling, where actually the voter is collaborating um, and getting some money or goods in exchange for his vote, but the voter is voluntarily participating to vote in a different way than his original intention. And on the other hand, coercion, where the voter is forced, so there is a real-time interaction, and you force the voter to do something else against his or her will to vote for a certain candidate. So researchers have tried to formalize this, but then a very interesting paper by Ben Smith then pointed out that these formal definitions actually are at the same time too strong and too weak. This is an indication that actually we still don't have a very good formalization. Uh, but informally, we can state that a voter cannot prove how they voted. And if a voter cannot prove this, well, then we can argue the system is coercion resistant because in our case, due to the hedgehog, the hedgehogs can always change the vote or nullify the vote. So even if you would get a proof how a voter voted well, in fact, in practice, the vote may have been different anyway because it may afterwards have been nullified. So, so far, I think we have not been able to 
solve this, but I think this is a reasonable definition we can work with. So what we try to achieve is that the voter can approve how they voted. And interestingly, um, in the voter sex scheme, um, even if the coercer learns the voter's keys, that will not help the coercer to actually uh, make sure that he knows how the voter voted, um, again, because of the nullification phase. So that was uh, the general principles, the goals we try to achieve, and the new ID. And David will now continue by going more in detail to explain how the scheme works. I think you got on mute. Sorry, Bart, can we go back to the system architecture? Sorry, Sorry I was on a hardware mute here. I was just saying that was a very well put, uh, Bart, and, and thanks for that. Um, so let's start with the system architecture. Uh, just say we're going to take a bit of a deeper dive, but first we'll just uh, take a bit, little bit of an overview with the system architecture type of, of uh, view. As you can see, all the main actors and the, and the sort of channels that exist between them uh, at various you know, times during the protocol. So you've got, of course, the voters and um, you know, there's the election authority. We, we typically call it in literature, EA, the, uh, in, in our model, we like to have that be decentralized as fully as possible. And, uh, but it doesn't have to be, of course. And then um, we have the uh, famous bulletin board function. That's where all the uh, votes are published or everything that, that you need in order to audit as an auditor on, on the far right there uh, is, is uh, made public in a kind of immutable, uh, widely available manner. And that's something, of course, blockchain seems to be, you know, aimed at achieving. So we're lucky to have that nowadays. Um, and then you notice the, uh, before I come to the hedgehogs, let's look at the XX in the middle there. That's a, you know, so-called mixing network. So it's a kind of untraceable sending system and the voters use that to communicate with the election authority and the bulletin board. And also um, the hedgehogs use it to communicate with the uh, election authority, uh, in, in fact, and then, uh, the so the uh, you know the flows to the auditors are shown as one way that makes, makes sense. But the, uh, the the special new thing is we have this notion of a hedgehog, and so there's you know a multiplicity of them possible, and the voter communicates with the hedgehog covertly. So that just means that the voter can choose hedgehogs way before the election or at any point uh, and it becomes very difficult to know if the voter has actually contacted or made any arrangements uh, with any hedgehogs and the voter can of course themselves be serve that role as Bart mentioned and actually an interesting aspect is that the hedgehogs can um, like convince the voters that they did this act now let's try to get a little more concrete about this nullification. Really what we're saying is, what we found is that it's almost like quantum physics. The best way to do this is just to just sort of bit flipping. So the hedgehogs can flip the bit, the voter can flip the bit, the, the vote buyer or coercers who get the keys of the voter can flip the bit. So if all kinds of people are flipping the bit, then it, it, in the end, it has no effect on the election outcome. So that's why we call it nullification. So uh, it, it, this, this is a kind of sophisticated uh, trick. And we, I think it's, it's somewhat optimal in this sense, it's probably the best you could do. And so um, that's how we're able to you know, cut the Gordian knot here. Um, let's, let's now look at the protocols from a you know, temporal point of view, Bart, if we could, thank you. So really, as, as was mentioned, we have three, there's three main phases. So the registration, always have that in voting. And we're assuming that the voters can register their, their these, these public keys and they have the private keys. And of course, we're assuming that the 
the influencers have those keys as well, and, and, and they can also be shared with hedgehogs uh, if the voter wants to allow the possibility of notification. And then during the voting phase, as was mentioned, each voter sends in a signature with one or the other of the, of the, of the uh, private keys corresponding to the registered public keys that correspond to the particular yes or no vote respectively. So uh, that's the pretty standard voting kind of a phase in a binary contest here for simplicity. Now we sh what's shown is a pre-tally. Turns out probably from privacy point of view, a little better that that tally is locked, but it's still shrouded in cryptographic secrecy. And so it's not, the actual tally is not made public, but it is locked. And then we allow for the nullification protocol uh, to take place in the third phase. And at the end of that, we can prove that the tally is correct, uh, that it corresponds with the pre-tally and whatever valid nullifications have taken place. And then of course that proof is fully auditable by any interested uh, parties online. So um, maybe next slide, please. Let's, let's look at these phases in a little more detail. Uh, just quickly here, so the, the registration phase uh, not everyone is is eligible, so some of those dotted lines are broken in the middle of that first uh, block on the left if they're not really eligible, but the output of the eligibility thing determines uh, some sort of, let's say, blinded values that then go into a, a mix. Uh, so sort of the allowance of entrance into that mix is the registration authority's uh, decision. And then what comes out of the mix are these these key pairs, and so you don't, no one knows which, uh, uh, you know, voter corresponds with which key pair. So then, in the voting phase, it's pretty simple. Um, next slide, please. You can see that the the voters just sign with one or the other of their keys and submit them. I mean, those voters who wish to vote, and they go through the C mix protocol uh, again. And so what's shown is coming out are, well, people could put rubbish in and then the, you, you get something that's not counted, like it's shown as an X there, but the checks are the valid, uh, is intended to symbolize the valid votes here. So this is the pre-tally, but it's not public yet, but it is uh, committed to cryptographically, if you will. And then um, we have the final phase, thanks Bart. So that's where the, the little guy at the bottom there, the, the hedgehog, where there may be a whole army of them, come in and now if they have the actual voter private keys, they participate in this multi-party protocol, which is quite efficient, it's a special protocol that lets them, if they have the key that was used to make a particular vote, then they can flip that vote. And that's what's shown here. And so uh, like an integer comes out for the yeses and another integer for the noes. This is the number of yeses that are canceled and this is the number of noes that are canceled. And then uh, that, that then goes into the uh, into the tally, but we'd like to keep those numbers hidden as well, ideally, and so that I, I believe we're able to extend the protocols to include the privacy of both the pre-tally and the, uh, the the modifications, and only prove that the, the, the final tally is uh, is correct. Um, so that's our uh, ultimate uh, version of the protocol. Um, next slide, please. I mean, if you like. Um, formulas and stuff we've got uh this is the high actual high level overview of the whole protocol but the real detailed ladder diagrams is to spend like at least three pages of of them and uh, i'm not going to have a chance to really go into this uh, but if you you know we're welcome any kind of uh, anyone wants to review this material i think it's up on the e-printer if it isn't it will be soon and uh and then we have the the uc proofs which is a whole different thing and a set of definitions and formalities uh, it has a, a, a broader scope, but basically uh, we found a couple different ways to do the underlying protocols that are efficient. One is with a, uh, a pretty fancy kind of new kind of mixing actually. And the other way is by uh, using a kind of homomorphic encryption and more uh, heavily traveled uh, techniques, uh, you know, uh, so uh, we can do it either way. And it seems that the homomorphic encryption way is a bit more efficient uh so uh that's the one we've implemented and we've implemented it i think well we'll come to that next slide please 
So let's shift gears here for a moment and, and just talk about the applicability of these techniques that Bart had, had mentioned. So the first, uh, on the left, you see the internet voting, and there we want to, we want to do it fully decentralized. And that means there's no dedicated election authority. There's no, uh, that's uh, like, there's like majority rule sort of election authority. And, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the CMIX protocols in the XX network, uh, that's a mixing uh, system where each, let's say one second, a different team of, let's say 500 or several thousand, right now it's about 350 nodes. It used to be 500, but now we're going to mainnet. Uh, the, that uh, are chosen, five of those are chosen randomly every second, and that's like verifiably random. And then the, the, they, they are the, the uh, sequence of nodes in the so-called mixed cascade. And this is very low latency because of the pre-computation, if you know about all this stuff. So uh, it's, uh, we have a, the XX network is sponsoring this project and uh, we do intend to use it in our, our governance of our decentralized uh, uh, network that has this mixing built in. So that's part of the innovation part. It really will be used and Part of that is we have a, I just have to mention a messenger client, which has been tested now by quite a few people. It is available for public testing. If you'd like to test it, uh, you know, so we have 500,000 people have tested it. It's, uh, that's a, like a, a pre-release version, but you could, it, you could use it just for like messaging between people like DM and also for like group chat and all the messages go through the, the mixing and there's no centralized information revealed about who talks to who or whatever. So it's, uh, it's a very nice Android and iOS uh, uh, high privacy uh, messenger that's quite clean and simple to use. And we intend to add the voting for network governance into that DAP, if you will, so it become very easily uh, accessible uh, to the public and the users. And you could just push the hedgehog button uh, and it'll find some in a hedgehog marketplace if you don't happen to have your own and you don't want to do any kind of fancy cryptography yourself. So just kind of like yes, no, later you say nullify, and that'll be in in in, in the app. Uh, and all those that client talks over this, over the the mess the uh, XX CMIX network. So it, as was shown in the architecture, all the messages are uh, untraceable from the from the voters. So it all works out nicely. Um, but there are other voting scenarios. So a lot of voting today is done by what people refer to as vote by mail. But as Bart points out, there's really two flavors. One is, at least one is where you receive a code on a piece of paper in the mail and you vote it online, uh, use the code online to cast your vote. And that's what we actually did in Tacoma Park, Maryland and uh, in, the sec in 2011. And then the other way is where you know you have to you, you send the physical paper back in that's a little bit unnecessary but uh you can still keep the the code and know and check that you've, it really did get recorded correctly as with the scan integrity system say that we, we use in, in maryland so um w what we have found in 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 working on vote xx and it's not in the paper fully yet but it's quite surprising, and that is that a voter who just receives a short vote code in, on, a, on a paper ballot form in mail, which would be either of those uh, vote by mail cases in the middle, they can, in effect, it can be converted into the private key that can be given to the hedgehog. So they can still nullify just with that, without having actually signed up to get a private key in advance. And so that's pretty, pretty sweet. And um, then, you know, as, as Bart mentioned, if we move over to the to the right side there, the uh, polling place voting, you know, you might think improper influence uh, is solved in polling place voting, but that's not really true. And another anecdote uh, to add to the list that Bart, Bart was, uh, you know, just touching on really, you know, in the East Coast of the United States, they have these voting machines. A lot of times for certain kinds of votes, you can, everyone in the polling place can hear how you're voting, for example. And uh, there are many other schemes uh, that, that are used and, 
So uh, it's really uh, actually beneficial to be able to apply these techniques there. And it turns out that the code voting that's used in the, in the uh, vote by mail schemes that I just mentioned can of course also be used in the polling place voting as long as it's code voting. And that's what we demonstrate in Tacoma Park, Maryland is the, next slide please. I think I hope that's the next slide. Yes, so here's the team uh, that, that did the election and in, 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 this was code voting. You know, when you filled the oval with the special pen, then the, the code was revealed to you. As you can see in that uh, box labeled Mark on the right. Uh, so this is just an ordinary like looking highlighter pen, but it has special chemicals in the mixed in with the uh, yellow ink and it uh, caused the oval to fill like in a half a second uh, turns black, but it would reveal the actual like a short uh, vote code that you could record and go home and check on. And if you look at the, if you go to the uh, Scantegrity I think it's the scantegrity.com website. You can see the video and all the stuff about this. And uh, you know, we the the this was by invitation that we conducted this election. And Alan Sherman really stepped up the plate and and took some personal liability and convinced his university that they should let him do this. And it was a everyone, you know, Ron Rivest came and spent like three months either or something with us to help us with this. And I made all the voting equipment here in LA and brought it out, <laughs> it's just a whole uh, fun uh, project and, and four people got their PhDs and there's some of them are, they're all shown here, uh, two of them in the back row there, the tallest ones in the project, I think are the ones who are in the, uh, coincidentally, the uh, Votex X project and, uh, and uh, there, there's me in the middle, I guess, and then Rick Carback uh, is also you know, it's instrumental in interfacing with the election author authorities and all that. The woman in the red sweater was the head of the whole uh, city government and worked closely with us and a number of the people there are also election. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. The, the woman standing next, sitting next, standing next to me in the blue dress was the head of it, uh, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the, the, all the user surveys we did, uh, uh, that were published showed that people like the code voting and you know, they just love to see that their vote, they could see that the vote was at least recorded as cast and they, but they couldn't show you how they voted because it was a random code. But because those codes aren't chosen from a uniform distribution, it actually constitutes a kind of proof of how they voted, even if they don't have any other documentary evidence. But in a, if you vote by mail from home, you would have physical documents also that could help substantiate that, you know, that you really did receive that code and, and so on. So it, it's even more secure. Um, yeah, but so uh, we think this was the first uh, real, what I would call publicly verifiable election that's ever been conducted. So anyone around the world could, you know, write their own auditing software or run variants of the different versions that were published by different people and check that everything really uh, did add up correctly. And the voters could check that the, uh, codes were published correctly. And so when you combine all that end to end, you had a publicly verifiable election that the voters really liked and worked fine. It was uh, way cheaper than most election technology that's out there because we used off the shelf inkjet printers, you know, home inkjet printers and small office scanners that could then be repurposed back into their so uh, we just all we had to do was inkjet print with our own inks these uh, the ballot forms. So it was just basically the cost of the paper and the you know very inexpensive inkjet ink uh, that we made ourselves. So um, it's really a, I think a landmark project in my view, and it was, it was such a great collaboration with everyone, and I think it's uh, should be celebrated by the community. Okay, next please. Well, this slide is just intended to give you a sense that we've really written all the code. Actually, we wrote it all uh, maybe in several earlier versions, but then two final versions that are uh, they're, they're meant to be completely compatible module by module so we can check them against each other and interchange them actually. And these are the modules. And uh, so we, the, the interface to the XX network is of course public, uh, that's XSDK. It's written in uh, Java, um, and uh, the all the 
nullification, all the homomorphic proof stuff was written in Mathematica twice and, and, and Java and check six ways to Sunday and all that. And so uh, it's a it's a pretty nice uh, implementation and we're trying, it's, it's been checked many ways and we're trying to make it uh, also as a kind of uh, online system that people can come to and just run a, like a small lecture to see how it works and look at all the numbers and stuff like that. That's an ongoing uh, uh, aim of the, of, the, of the project now that the, the elections basically are working as a, for a single election instance with a web interface. Um, and uh, yeah, um, next slide, please. This is, uh, you know, this is from an academic point of view, you know, so the real uh, interesting part of the, the project, how it ties out to other, you know, previous work and, and, and so on. And I don't think we're doing it full justice here, but you'll see in a minute, we've, we've also done some unprecedentedly good work to try to tie out to the rest of the literature. But here, uh, basically just try to summarize the, the approaches that we know of to preventing improper influence. And I think the first one, it's the, the famous, in the, in the voting community, we call it JCJ. That's uh, Ari Jules and, uh, um, uh, and Marcus Jacobson were the two J's and um, um, who I know pretty well, but the middle one is, uh, I think, uh, Catalano, who I don't know that well. Um, but uh, in the event, um, this was based on mixing. So the first stuff in the public literature on online voting, voting with computers, as it's been called, is uh, was my actual early mix paper, which appeared in 79 as a tech report. And then in, in uh, early 80s, it, it appeared in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, communications of the ACM and uh, been cited, I read somewhere 5,000 times. I don't know if it's really true, but you know, there's a lot of work been going on related to this uh, original paper, but most people don't realize that the voting was the reason I wrote it. And there's only like one or two paragraphs of a voting system out of the whole paper, but they do show how mixing can be used to create a, an online voting system, but you know, it wasn't able to deal with improper influence in any sense. And so JCJ, uh, took a stab at that, and they uh, had a, uh, uh, I think it's the, you know, sort of the poster child for systems where the, as, as Bart mentioned, there could be like fake uh, credentials to vote, fake keys uh, to vote, and um, that is uh, uh, really, you know, as uh, some of you may know, have known Gus Simmons, one of his favorite expression was belling the cat. You know, he's a, a great guy, he's really contributed a lot to the field. Um, and so you're basically, you're already assuming you've solved the improper influence in a sense by, by registering these fake keys with the EA too. So they know which are the fake keys and the real keys. It's not really a great, a great solution. And I don't think that they put it forward as like a perfect solution, but it was a first attempt in literature and this showed the importance of the problem and uh, kind of, you know, got the academic ball rolling. And then uh, there's another approach that was, that came up uh, in, uh, was used in practice in Sweden, I believe, and elsewhere and often mentioned, uh, like, basically you just say, okay, you can vote again uh, with your credentials or your whatever, and it's sort of the last vote you cast will be the one that counts. So you could show someone that you voted one way and then go to the polling place or mail in some other version later and, uh, and change it. Well, there's a lot of technical problems with that too. Uh, not the least of which is it's kind of easy to, you know, imagine that the improper influencer would kind of come to you sort of at the last minute uh, where you wouldn't really have a chance to do that without them, you know, becoming aware of it. Um, and uh, then the third approach is the uh, decoy ballots, which uh, some of us have worked on in the, uh, what was called the RS voting project, the random sample voting, which is a really interesting electoral system where you sample the voting population randomly. It turns out like if you just a thousand voters can with, if you have a reasonable margin, give a proof that all voters would have voted that way if they had Two weeks to focus on that one question. I think it's a really powerful 
uh, approach, and we plan to use it in uh, XX Network as well. It's very well suited for you know having a, a, a wide uh, uh, scale of um, uh, scope of of the uh, of voting, and then um, the uh, just just a minute. Let me just double check on something. One of my colleagues is in the hospital. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, he was in the hospital for chest pains and now he's back. He's out and he's in good shape. So thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> okay. So um, what we did with the, um, uh, in, the, in that work was we had these decoy ballots. There's a lot of a very detailed analysis about this. A lot of beautiful mathematics. You could, there's like you know, 10 pages of, would prove the Bayesian, you know, probabilities were all nice and neat and everything, but it's, and it's also going to be demonstrated experimentally and Ron Rivest did a lot of that work on it for another problem. Uh, any event, it's, um, we just give uh, anyone who wants one of these fake ballots and then they can kind of sell them. But the problem with it in part is that if, if it really stops vote buying, then there's not much of a market for these vote buying and then no one's really going to Take the trouble to get them and sell them, and anyways. But there's a whole analysis, a very sophisticated analysis of all this in, in some published work. Um, so uh, you'll find it on my uh, list of publications. An odd occurrence where I had a lot to do with the paper, but they ref the senior author refused to put my name on it. So I put it on my resume anyway. So you can <laughs> it's a disputed authorship, uh, but it's very very good work. And really, truth be told, mostly done by a, a graduate student, but I did have a lot to do with it. And um, uh, anyway, so that, and then we also have what's called seventh estate. Like you can look it up seven th dot estate and that, that whole system's up on the git and everything, but it's um, it's a paper-based voting system that handle also uses decoy ballots. It's a bit better because voters receive these decoys randomly and then they can um, uh, send them in and uh, uh, everything's, paper-based and it's verifiable. It's a really interesting system. Uh, I'd urge people to, to have a look at it. Let me just show you this with a little booklet that you can see when you go to that, uh, you get the correct domain name, you'll see this little booklet. It shows you how to do it, the whole election with uh, cartoons and paper, and it's a complete uh, election system based on, sorry about that, on, um, on, uh, on, um, Okay, uh, sample voting. Thanks. The final uh, slide I'd like to cover is just to point out that uh, we did one of the project members has done some extraordinary effort to, and it took a lot of manual work too, to go through and look at the whole voting literature and all the papers that were referenced by those papers and so on, and then use uh, these, these latest sort of AI techniques, machine learning to figure out uh, to test various theories and find how to group these papers in terms of how they related to improper influence and the terminology that they used. And you could actually see this. So we, there were basically four or five uh, computer runs that involved like 10 hours each. And you can see the analysis that we came up with there. We cluster clustered them in these ways. So we're really uh, trying to find out what's in the literature here because, you know, the voting literature is not a, super neatly organized uh, space. So uh, I think this is, represents quite a, uh, a show of respect for the existing efforts of others and also uh, helps really give us some certainty that we're, we've, we're grappling with a whole set of issues. So over to you, Bart. Thank you. So, of course, what we still have to look at is usability. Of course, the goals are that the system should be easy to use. So even if you add these hedgehogs it should be still easy for you to, because the average user, of course, is not a geek or a cryptographer. I think it's always a big challenge um, to actually make systems that have sophisticated cryptography behind them, but for the user, look very simple. And of course, the team does have quite some experience based on earlier elections with this. So how to make things easy to use, avoid mistakes, and be as similar as possible to other systems while st still having um, the fancy cryptography as much as possible under the hood. And we believe that we can also do this for vote XX. So time to wrap up. So I think the new idea we introduced here is to have a concept of hedgehogs, which is like trusted agents that help you to nullify your vote. 
And we believe that this is an innovative concept that allows you to achieve coercion resistance. And as we showed, it can work both for online voting, but also for um, systems where you vote in polling places or systems where there is a paper component. The system has been fully implemented and the UC proofs are being finalized. And so we believe it actually is a big step forward because together with protection against um, malicious hardware and software and denial of service, um, this is one of the building blocks that allows us to actually move to electronic voting in the future. So I think that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and we're happy to take questions. Usually the host would have a question, but Alan's part of the project, so <laughs> we need to, are there? What are your, your next um, plans? And, and do you have plans for actually carrying out an election with the system? That's a great question. Uh, let me try to feel that. Well, so as I mentioned, we do have a, uh, we have seen the actual full system working. It's not like a command line interface, more like with a web uh, interface. So that's uh, pretty nice. And now we're uh, let's, uh, trying to make it be more of a hosted demo site where you can go and run test elections yourself or maybe small real elections and just see how it all works and look at the code and everything. Um, that's, I think an important uh, effort. And then we do, uh, uh, speaking from the XX network uh, perspective, we have said that we are looking forward to integrating this technology into the governance of XX network, but we're not, you know, that's not uh, something that we've said we've already done. It's something we said we would like to try to do in the future. So that will depend on uh, progress in the in the in the project, but I can tell you that uh, there are three members of the Vote XX that are also heavily involved in XX Network, and they're one of them is me, and we're all uh, really enthusiastic about doing this. And uh, you know, when I, when I presented some of this work in a, in a, a recent event in uh, in Brazil, where voting is a big deal, and the integrity elections is now used in a funny new way, um, we uh, got questions about, you know, or, or this, people want us to use this in, in, in the XX network, and uh, that's, you know, that's our aim. I think that uh, sample voting that I mentioned, where there's a bunch of binary contests, right, is uh, very well suited to blockchain governance, because you, you know, eventually it's, there's a lot of little code changes that are needed and each one needs to be looked at pretty carefully. So you, everyone can't look at all of them in time. So by sort of dividing and conquering and having this anonymous random sampling of a provably verifiably random choice of juries for each different code update and a sort of a, with a yes, no uh, decision on it, 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 it works out very well. So uh, that we, we'd like, uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to integrate sample voting and the, uh, of course, improper influence of vote XX into, with a decentralized EA into the XX network, but I'm not promising we're going to be doing that. I have to be a little bit clear on that, but that is, that's something that I would personally like to see happen. And that is kind of, that's why we've been working on this. And if we had gotten, you know, we might have might have been done already if we had gotten further. But the, it's it's been a quite an effort to get uh, everything worked out this far and uh, in the Vote XX project. And I think, you know, uh, having the UC proofs and the, the really good implementations and such a comprehensive survey of the literature and and all this, uh, it's 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 quite an extraordinarily well done project as well. So. Uh, that that's uh, that's uh, 
uh, pleasure to be involved in. I think it makes a very strong statement about this uh, technology. And you know, I would say we have a somewhat of an all-star cast of, uh, of of team members as well, and that's it's been uh, uh, really great. These are, I think, what you find in the voting space. These are people that really care about voting. A lot of people are more academics, and they're worried about this and that. So uh, we been really, I've been very pleased to be able to bring in people who are really care about voting and and, and uh, uh, so I think we're, we're really lucky to have such a great uh, team that all wants to take this forward. So I think it will it will continue to go forward. I so see David, Dr. Fatak and some others are asking questions in the chat about um, the trustworthiness of the hedgehogs. Um, what what happens if um, a hedgehog who knows the keys uh, turns against the voter? So, well, I, I let me answer that as I guess I wasn't sure Bart could as well, but I'll just do real quickly. Uh, there's a couple of uh, you know considerations. One is that don't forget the voter can choose any number of hedgehogs to work with. Um, as Bart had mentioned, they would be trusted by the voter. That might be because they're from a hedgehog marketplace, so they have they're incentivized, and and there's a you know so forth and so on. But um, the idea is that if 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 you want to nullify your vote and you give your key to uh, a number of hedgehogs, any one of them could basically flip it. So uh, you don't have to count on them all doing it or uh, just, you know, any one of them. So it's. And who knows, maybe the vote, the vote buyer or Carissa will also try to flip your vote and then you could flip it. And as I mentioned in the architecture uh, slide, there is also the possibility the hedgehog can prove to you that they did the hedgehog function correctly. And that's a really interesting thing. Because can the hedgehog with knowledge of these keys do any other damage? Well, no, no, you only have to give them the key for the vote that you want nullified. So once you give that key, uh, you know, then that vote should be should be nullified. That's all they can do. So you presumably, if it wasn't cast, it can't be nullified. And so, yeah, I, I think that's that's uh, pretty much, uh, yeah, yeah. The, it it this is arguably like the new aspect. You know, uh, there's a uh, fellow that I have known, Martin Hurt, who proved some very interesting theoretical results related to very good work by uh, Joe Killian and uh, the woman whose name was. Kazuo uh, Sako at that time, um, uh, uh, a series of papers they did that show that you have to have some kind of thing, some kind of secret channel, but this channel is a channel for the current technological environment. It's very, very easily achieved and very practical. And with the fact that, that you can choose your own multiplicity and that the coercer might do flip it and you might flip it, and then also with the proofs that could be available to you, I don't think there's really any shortcoming in it, uh, especially when you take the UI UX uh, aspect that I mentioned into account, which is that, you know, it could just be as simple as pushing a button for the voter on the uh, on the app they're using to vote. So, yeah, looks uh, looks uh, looks pretty airtight. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a funny way through, but it, it does not violate any of the, the, the theorems that are out there. And what it really does, and maybe this is an important point I should have mentioned, not only does it cut the Gordian knot, it it thereby greatly simplifies voting protocols generally because it is sort of it's sort of a proper partitioning of concerns and interfaces. So it takes a lot of under pressure off the voting mechanics that has caused that to be convoluted. So we use very, very clean, simple registration of voting mechanics, and then uh, deal with this aspect in a, in a separated uh, manner. And so that actually makes for a better voting system and allows this feature. So it's, uh, uh, we're really you know, happy with the way this all uh, turned out. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time now. Uh, the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab will reconvene in two weeks. Thank you, Alan, for inviting us. Thanks. Great thank you for having us. All of you. It's our pleasure. Thank you.
Bye. Bye-bye.